Welcome, everyone. Uh, I believe I'm the first talk of the day. For thanks, thanks for coming out bright and early. A lively crowd, I see. Everyone uh, went to bed real early last night. No after parties, I assume. So, kudos to all of you. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. This is my first time in Finland, um, and I'm excited to share a little bit about this technology called CRISPR um, that we're using at Mammoth, uh, in particular to build genetic therapies. So, we'll we'll start by going a little bit into what CRISPR is. Uh, and then we'll go into kind of what we're doing at Mammoth to take this technology to the next step. So uh, if you haven't heard of CRISPR, CRISPR is this really exciting new genetic engineering technology. Um, and it was, the first papers were published about 10 years ago. Um, and one of my co-founders, Jennifer Doudna, actually won the Nobel Prize for her pioneering work in this technology a couple years ago. And what's really exciting about this technology is that it's a way of programming life very similar to how we program computers. And if you remember your high school biology, at least this is how I was taught biology, biology is taught as this very kind of squishy, messy, like kind of intractable uh, field of study um, that's almost like uh, stamp collecting, I think is the famous Ernst Rutherford quote. And um, this technology is a way of really enabling us to engineer biology in very reproducible and very specific ways. And I think that's incredibly exciting, because there's no more complex computer than ourselves, right, than our brains. You know, neural nets and all these things are all trying to mirror our brains in some way. And CRISPR is a really uh, reproducible and very specific way of actually changing the code of life, so DNA or RNA, um, that's in all of our cells. So when the technology first came out, uh, I put a bunch of magazine covers here of kind of the things that people were talking about. So it's like editing humanity, engineering the human race, uh, and if you really think about the long term of like, okay, we can edit our genomes and what that can mean, there's all sorts of different directions you can go. And it just doesn't even have to be therapeutics. You can think about agriculture and engineering plants so that we can have better crops and more nutritious uh, meals. Or you can think about uh, diagnostics, or you can think about biomanufacturing. I've seen some other companies here um, that are trying to leverage like microbes and other organisms to manufacture products that we use in a variety of things. And these can all be supercharged with a technology like CRISPR that allows you to actually engineer uh, these organisms. Um, but the area that I'm most excited about is definitely uh, therapies, and, in speci and specifically genetic therapies. So if you think about our genome as a giant Word document, so it's billions of letters, uh, in this case, A, T, C, and G. It's a very limited alphabet, so maybe a simpler language in some ways than what you would actually find uh, in, in a Word document. But you can think of CRISPR as two components. The first component, and they're, and they're equally important, the first component is a control F, or kind of like a Google search engine. So if you have this giant Word document of like billions of base pairs, and you only want to change a very specific word in that document, or maybe even a specific letter, or maybe a paragraph, the first step is you have to somehow find it. And that's a really, really difficult problem. And remember, we're dealing in messy biology space as well. So this CRISPR technology can actually go in and locate a very specific part of the genome. And then the next thing is that you want to somehow change it, right? So if you just locate it, that's fine. That's, that's a good first step. But you need to actually be able to modify it. And you can think of that as like kind of a control X or a copy paste. And as it turns out, there's different flavors of this CRISPR technology, some of them that can like, even italicize a word or bold it or delete a word or add a paragraph. Um, and depending on what you're trying to do, you might want to leverage any or all of these different techniques. But before we dive into that, I think it's useful to take a step back in time a little bit into like, what CRISPR is. Um, kudos to anyone in the audience that actually knows what CRISPR stands for. It's an acronym. I don't know if it's too early for a call and response, if someone wants to throw out what it means. Um, but it stands for Clustered Regulatory Interspace Short Palindromic Refeed. It's a bit of a mouthful. You can see why we call it CRISPR. Um, and the, what it comes from is actually this really interesting uh, natural phenomenon, which is that bacteria, very similar to ourselves, have an adaptive immune system. So our bodies try and prevent us from being sick. As it turns out, bacteria, even though they're the, these very simple relative to us organisms, they also have an adaptive immunity. And that adaptive immunity is CRISPR. And what they're trying to protect themselves against is viruses that are invading them. So again, if you remember your high school biology, viruses will invade a bacteria, inject a bunch of genetic material in order to make that bacteria a virus factory that then will create a bunch of viruses and kill the bacteria. So bacteria don't like that, understandably. And the way it works is that if a virus um, finds a bacteria and it injects its genetic material, so this is like, say, DNA or RNA, 
then what happens is that the bacteria is constantly having these CRISPR proteins, so CRISPR is a protein, going around, and it has what's called a guide RNA. And that's the, the thing in red with the little uh, herringbone black uh, cartoon next to it. And what this guide RNA does uh, through a process we won't get into today is that it basically says, I've been invaded by viruses before, and my billions of progeny before me have been invaded by viruses before. So I know the red sequence is bad. That's a viral sequence. And it's not found in my own genome or in other stuff that I don't care about. So if you see that red sequence, cut it up. Um, physically, just chop it up. And if you chop up genetic material, it's rather useless, uh, at least for this purpose. So these CRISPR proteins are kind of little sentinels that are in the bacteria going around saying, have I been invaded by a virus? And if so, I'm going to defend myself by chopping it up with molecular scissors that just physically cleave the, the DNA. And if we zoom in on that, so this uh, kind of gray glob here is the, what we call Cas system, where the most famous one being the thing called Cas9 that you might have heard of if you've read about the space. And then that, um, again, the red thing is the guide RNA. And that's really the secret sauce of CRISPR is that you can use the same Cas9, Cas protein for everything, but you can switch out that guide to go after any sequence. And that's the kind of programmable part. So if you think of the CRISPR-Cas system as Google, then the guide RNA is kind of what you're typing into Google to search for something. And as it turns out, we're really, really good at uh, synthesizing these guides, and we can also come up with rules for designing them. Um, so this is a very facile process, and it's, it's very democratizing, actually. There's other technologies before CRISPR that could be used for types of genetic editing, but one of the main pitfalls of them is that they were very laborious to actually get to work. You would take you know, multiple PhDs, like years, to um, actually develop um, the tool for a specific application. Whereas this, literally high schoolers can do this, which is incredibly exciting, I think. And it really kind of like opens up the, the doors to a whole new world of biology. There's another uh, famous quote about uh, science moves forward with new tool development. I think this is a really clear example of that as well. It just opens up the possibilities of what kind of experiments you can even think about. And if you remember your high school biology again, I promise the last time I'm going to say that, then you have your base pairing, A to T, C to G. So your guide RNA, the way it can tell what sequence you're going after is that it's complementary to the sequence that you're going to. And again, that's a very easy thing to design. So that, that's the CRISPR-Cas system. So it's an incredibly exciting technology. Um, but there are real limitations um, to this kind of first generation of it. And at Mammoth, that's um, what we're uh, kind of driving forward is this next generation that we think overcomes some of these limitations, where some of the key limitations here that we'll talk about are in particular barriers to what we call in vivo applications. And we'll go into that in a second, so that's in the body. Um, some of the other things people worry about are things like off-target effects. Um, so what if it's not only going to the sequence you want it to go to? What if in that billions of base pairs in that Word document, it's actually going a couple other places? That could be pretty bad. Um, you don't want it going to other locations. Um, and you can think about, can you actually target every region of the genome, and a bunch of other things as well. Um, but before going too much into the limitations, I do want to say that the, the first generation technologies like Cas9 have made immense progress. So actually, in the last month, the very first CRISPR-based therapy was approved uh, for the first time in the world uh, in the UK. Um, and very likely, there'll be news um, in the US in the next month as well. And um, apologies to everyone from software in the room, but 10 years from a fundamental discovery to something actually being approved by the FDA is incredible. That's a testament to the technology. It's a testament to the teams and companies and academic labs around the world that have been driving this forward. But that is incredibly fast, and it's incredibly effective as well. So I want to point out, um, this is, this is sci-fi, um, but it's not sci-fi. This is something where there's people walking around today who have been treated with this technology. Uh, and I think that's incredible. So it's more about how do we take it to the next level. And in particular at Mammoth, what we're really excited about is you can use this to actually potentially cure diseases. So when we think about drugs today, we really think about it as like, you know, you're on it the rest of your life. It's, it's treating the symptoms often, or it's, uh, it's not actually curing you, though, of the disease. And for diseases that have a genetic basis, um, for example, like sickle cell disease or like beta thalassemia or, um, you know, many other uh, disorders you can think of, like Alzheimer's for many patients. Um, these have a very clear location in the genome, sometimes that we've known for decades, that if you can change that location in the genome, you can cure the disease functionally, potentially. Uh, and that's very, very exciting. But there's two ways you can do this. The first one is called in vivo, and that's in the body, and the second one is ex vivo, or outside the body. And ex vivo means you take the cells out and you edit them outside the body and then you put them back in. 
So you can imagine for like blood-based disorders, like sickle cell disease, this is very effective. And, that, and this gives you a lot of latitude. You can do a lot of things to cells outside of the body. Whereas um, for in vivo, um, that means you're giving an injection, it's going to the tissue, and it's actually editing in the body. So if you could do everything ex vivo, that'd be great. There's a lot of advantages. But as it turns out, many of the diseases that we care about that are genetic, maybe, I would dare say the majority, um, are not things where you can take the cells out of the body. Like if I take your brain out and then put it back in, there's going to be side effects, I imagine. Um, so you want to be able to somehow inject it, have it go where it needs to go. And um, this means you have to worry a lot about, like, are you doing it effectively? Are you doing it safely? And one of the biggest things you have to worry about is the delivery of the system. And um, before going to delivery, I, I want to point out that all the, all the work we're doing is only possible because of the really great uh, team that we have, including my co-founders, Janice Lucas, and of course, uh, Jennifer Doudna, who won the Nobel Prize for her work in this space. And, and we have a really great set of investors that believe in the long-term vision uh, of building a biotech company that can actually tackle these grand challenges. And the way we've uh, kind of tackled this delivery problem is that actually one of the big limitations is that these proteins are really large. Um, and if you think about proteins, they're all small relative to us, but if you zoom down onto their scale, um, they actually vary in size quite a bit. And one of the things we realized is that because CRISPR systems are the adaptive immunity of bacteria, there's billions of bacteria all around us. And if we go out and sample it, it could be from farms, it could be from like, toilet seats, it can be from anywhere, bacteria all around us, then there's going to be all sorts of potential new CRISPR technologies. Um, so over here, you can see on the left, we, we sampled all these uh, different sites and like, digested all these different databases. And we, we sort through billions and billions of proteins to find new versions of this CRISPR technology that have new names like Cas Phi or Cas14 that are, that are not Cas9. And, and one of the big um, things that we're excited about is that actually we found that some of these are much, much, much smaller. Uh, and there's other advantages as well that we won't go into today. But on the size, this actually ends up being incredibly important. So on the bottom of this slide are what we call the legacy systems. So these are things like Cas9, which is the one we were kind of talking about at the beginning. And they're around, let's say, 1,400 amino acids. So they have quite a large size. And uh, if you kind of mine through all these metagenomic databases, what you can find is actually what we call these ultra-compact systems that are a third or less the size of the legacy ones. You can see them up here uh, in green. And what's really interesting about this is if you look at how we actually deliver these to the different parts of the body, there's two dominant ways. The first one you may have heard of um, because it's used in the vaccines. Uh, so that's LNP, or lipid nanoparticle. Uh, and that's really useful in particular for going to certain tissues like the liver. But if you want to go extra hepatically, so anywhere that's not the liver, um, you really typically are going to use this thing called AAV. And this is another really interesting story about kind of co-opting natural machinery, in this case, adeno-associated viruses. Again, viruses are really good at getting into cells. Um, and using it to actually deliver our own payloads. But the big limitation is that it can only fit certain sizes. And, and the best analogy is probably like, let's say you're in downtown Helsinki and you're trying to get around. It's going to be a lot easier if you have a smart car versus like a freight trailer. Right? It's just going to be more difficult to get to the different areas. But if you, your cargo requires a freight trailer, you've got to use a freight trailer. But if you had a smart car, you could more easily and effectively, probably safely, uh, get to where you need to go. And, and that's the advantage of these really small systems, is that they can really squeeze into these things like AV with a bunch of room for doing, doing other, uh, other applications as well. And, and the main other application that we're really excited about that this really enables goes back to one of the things I mentioned at the beginning, that there's different types of edits you might want to do to that Word document. So you can imagine, uh, instead of just turning a gene off completely or just turning it on completely, maybe you want to adjust the volume of it. So maybe you want to bold or italicize the word to abuse the metaphor. And that could be like epigenetic editing. So instead of even changing the, the DNA itself, maybe you just add some methylation or something um, that modifies the expression. Or maybe you want to add in a whole new paragraph. Maybe you want to just add a whole new sequence. Uh, that would be something like gene writing. Or maybe out of those billions and billions of base pairs, you want to change a single letter. And that would be like base editing, for example. And these are all different techniques that kind of use the CRISPR system as that search function. And they have a different, instead of copy-paste, they're doing something, something different. Um, and depending on, and this is really going to be driven by the disease that you're going after, what type of edit you want to do. It can, be, it can vary uh, quite a bit. So, what you're able to do by having these really small systems is that you can now deliver all this other payload you need to do, it, to do these unique types of edits. And these payloads can be quite large as well. And this has been a really, really big challenge of the space. But 
I think if we really want to deliver on the promise of genetic medicine, you need to be able to do any type of edit anywhere. That, that's really the goal that we have to achieve. So this clicker works. Um, I think the, the key things I'd like you to take away from today, aside from some biology, hopefully, um, are, are twofold. So one, we're at this incredible uh, crossroads in biology in general, where it really is becoming more of an engineering discipline. And we're really able to think about it kind of more in that fashion. And that's definitely not how I was taught biology. And I think it really opens up a lot of different doors to a lot of exciting applications uh, in therapeutics and beyond. And then the second one, um, which is more, more specific to kind of Mammoth as a company, is that these engineering applications allow you to build what we call platform companies. And these have been very rare in biology. Often it's like the first drug you build, great, you, you managed to do it successfully. The second one's just as hard. The third one's just as hard. Um, but when you have a technology like CRISPR, because it's reprogrammable, building the second, third, fourth drug on top of it actually gets easier and easier and easier. And this is not something that's typical in biology. It's this new kind of wave of what we call platform biotech. Uh, and we're very excited that Mammoth is a part of this wave, and it really enables you to actually build lasting biotech companies um, that don't just go after one disease or two diseases, but actually build out whole platforms that can tackle potentially all of genetic disease. And, and that's not something that's been possible before. So that's what I'd like you to take away from today. Thanks for coming out bright and early, and uh, hope to see you around if you have any questions. Thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure.